Welcome to Season 5 of the Agile Brand with Greg Kilstrom, where we talk with enterprise and technology platform leaders about the people, processes, and platforms that make marketing and customer experience successful, scalable, and sustainable. This is what creates an Agile brand. I'm your host, Greg Kilstrom, advisor and consultant for Fortune 1000 marketing and CX leaders and teams as principal and chief strategist at GK5A and best-selling author, keynote speaker, entrepreneur, and Agile certified coach. The Agile Brand Podcast is brought to you by Tech Systems, an industry leader in full stack technology services, talent services, and real world application. For more information, go to teksystems.com. To sign up for the Agile Brand newsletter and get the latest insights and articles on marketing technology and CX, or to purchase a copy of my latest book, House of the Customer, go to gregkillstrom.com. You can also find all my books on Amazon and other retailers. And now on to the show. Today, we're going to talk about addressing agile skepticism and utilizing Scrum successfully to create high performance teams. To help me discuss this topic, I'd like to welcome Daria Bagina, founder, trainer, and coach at Scrum Mastered. Daria, welcome to the show. Hi, hello. Thank you for having me. Very excited to talk to you about this topic. Yeah, me too. You're looking forward to it. Uh, definitely, you know, you're you're on the right show. We're on, on the Agile brand here. So I don't actually get to talk with uh, as many uh, scrum masters and 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 such as uh, as you might think. So look, looking forward to this. So let's, let's get started by talking about agile practices and the current business environment. Do you think agile is becoming more or less relevant in the current business environment? I think Agile is becoming more and more relevant, actually, especially we can see that, I think, with everything that happened in the past couple of years with COVID and the closures and how a lot of businesses had to adapt to all of those changes very rapidly. So I think that it just showed that how important it is to be really on the train, on the Agile train. Yeah. Yeah. Agreed. Agreed. So... You know, given given that, can you how, how can you use agile practices to cultivate an environment where a scrum team can really flourish in this, as, as you mentioned, in this changing environment we live in? Well, I think really it's more about the change of how we manage people and projects. The biggest change to really that happens with ad- agility is that we need to switch from that management mindset, the kind of command and control mindset to servant leadership and really letting the teams figure out how to to do things and what is the best approach because they know better. Yeah. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit more about the the servant leadership and, you know, definitely that's definitely a, a, a big component of it. But for those maybe a little less familiar, can you talk about what that means to you? Yeah. So it's really kind of looking at the leadership in general, right? Leadership is really about not managing people or telling them what to do, but inspiring them to to do better, right? And I think certain leadership is being a leader, inspiring people without authority, being able to, to show them the way, but also, you know, holding them accountable so that they can achieve greater heights and really more caring about their success rather than your own, because their success will lead to your success. Really just caring about the people that you lead. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's that's one of the things where, you know, a, a lot of people when they first hear about Agile, they get introduced to Agile through something like Scrum, where there's, you know, rituals, and we'll talk about some of that stuff in, in a minute here, even, but, you know, they get introduced to Agile in terms of, okay, you need to do this, and then you need to do that. And instead of really the, the principles of, of Agile, and, you know, you, you definitely mentioned, you know, the, the servant leadership aspect, but there's, you know, that, that encompasses, as, as you're saying, that encompasses so many things and, and really more principles of, of behavior than, than simply, you know, do this, then do that and, and stuff like that. So, yeah. What, what are your thoughts there as far as, you know, do, do people sort of often get the wrong impression about Agile before they really start using it in practice? 
Yeah, I think, unfortunately, that is the case for a number of different reasons, really, that people are introduced, as you say, to Agile often through frameworks like Scrum, maybe Safe, um, and those frameworks are often taken more like processes and, you know, for example, often people say that Scrum is an Agile project management methodology even, you know, but that's not the case. And that creates the wrong impression that kind of gives a message that Agile is all about this new processes that just get in the way of the work, whereas the real Agile is about those behaviors, how we work. It's not about the processes at all. Yeah, yeah. So given that, um, we are going to talk a little bit about uh, you know, some of those, some of those practices. And, you know, I, I did want to talk because you do a lot of coaching and and you do training and, and things like that. So d- I did want to talk a l- about that a little bit. But first, uh, you know, do you mind giving a little background on, you know, what what you do in terms of, of your work and your coaching and, and training? So I started my Agile path um, back in 2014 when I was switching into the Scrum Master role and I didn't really understand what it was at the time and learned all the wrong things. I was introduced to to Agile also in all the wrong uh, kind of way. But I continued in the, the Scrum Master role and the more I learned about agility and about the role, the more I actually started loving it and just enjoying that servant leadership aspect, being able to help the teams. And I continue to be a Scrum Master in many different companies, uh, many different uh, fields as well. And after that, I just wanted to kind of spread that knowledge because I remember the first couple of years of being a Scrum Master, they were extremely painful and scary, and no one was there to support me. And now I want to help others to kind of go through that period with ease. So I am not only providing training as a professional Scrum trainer with Scrum.org, but I am also a mentor for Scrum Masters. So I'm running some mentorship, one-on-one mentorship and, you know, community to help Scrum Masters get to the point in their career where they just enjoy what the, what they do. Yeah, that's great. That's great. So yeah, then let's, let's dive in, you know, certainly um, there's a lot we could talk about here and um, a lot of different aspects of, of putting agile in practice, but, you know, speaking of scrum and, you know, one of the, one of the critical parts of scrum is, is the retrospective and, even though they are a critical part, uh, they're often not done well. What's, what is your advice to, you know, how can you make your next retrospective not only fun and, and enjoyable, but, but also really helpful and, and valuable to the team? Yeah, it's a big topic. Like I can, I can write yeah. a book and I did write a book on this topic. So, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but um, a few things I think that can immediately help. And I I like that you said, how can we make it fun and enjoyable, but also productive? And I feel that often people get stuck on the fun and enjoyable a little bit too much. While, yes, we wanted to be, you know, we want people to come in, to enjoy that time together, to have some, you know, team building happening. But in the end, the retrospective is a serious meeting. (laughs) This is where we need to talk about how we can get better? How can we improve? And I think bringing back that focus on the improvement part is really important. And that can be done through making sure that you always talk about the action items or the things that you wanted to do since the last retrospective, kind of bringing it in into the discussion, reviewing the progress, then always finishing up with something with at least one thing, actionable item that you can actually take into the next sprint. And that is already a great improvement. You inferred some of this already, but you know, what, what are some of the things that, that people tend to get most wrong about the retrospective, like either you know, misconception or just behaviors that, that don't help as much as they could? So often retrospectives either turn into just this fun time Let's just yeah. all have fun. 
And what happens is that then the, the team members, they feel that they're wasting their time. Yes, they want to have fun, but then they also have all of that other work they need to finish. So they don't see the value in that, the retrospectives. Do we really need to have that team building every single sprint? So that the, the yeah. purpose of the retrospective get lost there, gets lost there. But another way, kind of how it sometimes ends up, is the retrospective turns into the airing of grievances, as one of the uh, developers <laughs> yeah, used to yeah. say. And it's just a rant session. And people just say, kind of complain about different problems and challenges they have to face, but they never end up with anything tangible. So it's kind of like a group therapy session with nothing at the end. And once again, that turns into just time spent on talking, but not actually doing any kind of work. And it feels useless. Before we continue, I'd like to make sure you're aware of the upcoming CXPS 2023 conference, May 8 through 11, 2023 in Durham, North Carolina. CXPS is a great CX event focused on professional services firms that want to know how to take the next steps to make their firm successful in integrating client experience with their firm's strategic initiatives. To learn more and register for the conference, go to clientexperience.org slash cxps dash conference. That's clientexperience.org slash cxps dash conference. And you can register with the code Agile 200, that's A-G-I-L-E 200, for $200 off your tickets. You can hear from top professional services executives and CX thought leaders like myself through a combination of keynotes, breakout sessions, workshops, and panel discussions. Make sure to register at clientexperience.org slash CXPS dash conference with the code Agile 200 for $200 off your tickets. Now let's get back to the show. So I've done, uh, I've worked with scrum teams in an in-person environment, uh, you know, let's say back in the day <laughs> before um, the world kind of went mostly hybrid and remote. And, you know, I've also done done it with remote teams where, you know, just part of a global company and they've they've always been remote. But, you know, for a lot of teams, remote and hybrid work has, has shifted the way that business is done. What can you do to increase engagement and get results from remote remote meetings where, you know, maybe the team has been used to working together and on a whiteboard or stickies or, you know, whatever, whatever they might have used in prior times. So I was thinking about that, I think, uh, when it all changed, you know, every, everything went remote and a lot of teams were struggling to just stay engaged. I was thinking, why is that happening? You know, we go to the office and we manage to be more productive, at least in the meeting setting. So why doesn't it work when we are remote? And what I found out, at least the conclusion I came to, is that we don't have any working or like unspoken rules that we have already established in the remote setting, because even though the technology has existed for a really long time, we haven't worked in it long enough to establish some of those working agreements and unspoken rules of how it is, how should we behave in a professional setting when we work remotely, right? When we go into yeah. the office, we have some rules, right? You say hello to your colleagues, you are dressed uh, professionally, right? You're not going to the office right. in your pajamas, <laughs> right. but we don't have those rules yet for remote work. And that brings problems like people don't want to be on camera. They maybe are, are in their pajamas and that's why they don't want to be on camera, yeah. you know, or they are doing something else at the same time, which would be really frowned upon if you're in a meeting with everyone else. Right. Yeah. yeah. And I think kind of going back to that, let's create working agreements together as a team. Let's make sure that we all agree on what it means to behave professionally in a remote meeting. Yeah. Yeah, I love that. So la last topic I wanted to talk about with you, it 
wanted to address uh, address some of what I would call the agile skepticism that exists. We, we talked about this a little bit at the very beginning, but mm-hmm. you know, w- what do you say to someone who says something like, you know, we tried agile at my last company and it didn't work? There's lots of things wrong, even with that <laughs> with that statement. But um, you know, we we tried agile, it didn't work, or you know, I don't like agile, or you know, it. it it's what you were saying, you know, it gets in the way, you know, have you gotten anyone to overcome their objections and to look at agile in a new way? And, you know, what are, what are the, some, some of the ways that you do that? You may end up with someone who can overcome their objections, these objections, and that there is someone who cannot, right? Yeah. So in the latter case, this is what we call kind of someone who doesn't want to be coached and you cannot coach someone who doesn't want to be coached. So this is more about how do we work around it? But often, most of the times, at least in my career, I would have someone who kind of says, oh, Scrum doesn't work. We already tried it. No results, right? Uh, I just say, okay, let's then, you know, put aside all of those Scrum and Agile terms and let's just focus on how I can help you. And without even kind of telling sometimes people, I use Agile and Scrum practices to make their team work much better. And then that kind of comes back to that point of, hey, you see, Agile actually works. It's just you didn't know that it was Agile. I just used those practices to help you. Yeah, yeah. And uh, one more thing with that. So, you know, I've I've worked with teams in in a number of different disciplines as well. Um, and, you know, just curious your thoughts. I mean, do you primarily work with like software engineering teams or have you worked with other types of, of disciplines? And, you know, what are you seeing in, you know, certainly Ag- Agile got its start in, in, you know, software and manufacturing and in those areas. But, you know, I've used it with marketing teams and, and others as well. Like what, what are you seeing in, you know, how um, Agile practices are kind of making their way into other parts of the organization? I think it is becoming much more, much more popular, I'd say, because other disciplines see the value in some of those agile practices. So I have been working a lot with software engineering teams, with very technical teams, um, you know, and medium technical teams, but I also worked with teams that are not at all technical. You know, we had um, worked with a team where we had people from logistics, from marketing, from learning and development. Mm. And we didn't really have the technical aspect. And I think the it is absolutely possible to apply Scrum and Agile to those disciplines. And even now we can see that Scrum is trying to kind of associate itself much more with other disciplines apart from software development, yeah. where instead of using terms like potentially releasable, we start saying, okay, what is a usable, a working product for your case. And I think it can be very well applied in the same way. It's once again, it's not really a process, right? It's really about how we change the way we work together and every discipline and every team can definitely benefit from it. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I've also talked with plenty of people that are, I would say they're very adamant that agile is the best way to do things or wouldn't even go so far as to say the only only way to do things well but you know what are what are your thoughts there is is agile the only way to do things well or can multiple approaches coexist with with one another this is something that we uh, teach in our scrum classes that you need to to use the right process for the right problem Agile works in the complex environment where we have a lot of different factors that may impact our work, where you have a lot of uncertainty, you know, and that not only applies to software development, but just generally to product development, to any kind of creative work. But there are some other types of work that are much simpler. They don't need Agile. They don't need Scrum. They work really well with how they used to work, you know, that uh, aspect of um, Taylorism, of measuring performance in the factories, it worked well, right? It was a great method to use in those settings. So why would you change it now if the work itself didn't change? 
So I think it's just really about figuring out what environment you're living in, your business is living in. Most of the businesses are living in a complex environment, but if your product or your business doesn't live in a complex environment, then maybe Agile is not the thing that you should use. Yeah, yeah. And what about organizations that different teams are doing things different ways? Sometimes even their Scrum is being used in an organization, but the sprint lengths don't line up. And so, you know, just there, there's there's differences, even if there's, there are some similarities in adopting agile principles and and things like that, you know, how does an organization try to reconcile that when, you know, again, different teams doing different things, different ways? I think this is good if different teams are doing things different ways, because this is kind of the whole point of agile. It's you need to adapt to your situation. You need to be flexible. It's all about continuous improvement, inspection, adaptation. And some teams may want to have shorter sprints just because how they, what their product is, what kind of work they need to do to build their product. And some teams will have longer sprints, right? Because of other constraints that are put on their product. And I think that what often happens, you would have a pilot team and they would try it. They would implement a certain process on it it would work and they would take the same process and slap it on another team. And then they wonder, why doesn't it work? Well, because in the pilot team, you actually experimented, you inspected and adapted the process to this team, but trying to implement it in another team exactly the same way, you're not doing inspection adaptation. That's why it doesn't work. And I think it's really about uh, figuring out you cannot have just one thing, the one same process that will be applied perfectly to every single situation, every single team. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's, it's kind of funny because the, the name gives it away, right? I mean, you know, what, what you're saying completely agree with is, you know, it's supposed to be, it's not supposed to be this rigid process. It's, it's called agile for a reason. Right. And so I think, I do think that's where, you know, to, to address the skepticism part, you know, I I think that's where a lot of people get this wrong is they think, okay, well, we're applying this thing. It's called agile, but agile has nothing to do with the way that it's implemented. Whereas, you know, what you're saying and and completely agree with it is by its very nature, it's supposed to be flexible. And, you know, when everyone can do things in a similar way, there might be some benefits, but if it doesn't work, we have to use common sense, right. And, and, and do things in a way that's going to deliver the best results. So, to- totally agree. Well, one one last question before we wrap up here. What's one piece of advice you would have for, uh, you know, let's say someone, a, a leader at an organization who believes that adopting agile practices will improve how their team's going to be able to deliver. But, you know, they might be p- uh, facing some pushback either from their peers, leaders, or even their team. You know, what's, what's one piece of advice you would have for them? I, I think that... One of the kind of the hardest piece of advice or the hardest thing that needs to change sometimes is really making sure that you have the right people in your organization to make the change happen. Because sometimes people don't want to change or maybe they will not be happy in an agile environment. And it's important to recognize that and make sure that you have the right people in your teams who are interested in making that change and who want to change. Yeah, I love that. Great, great advice. Well, again, I'd like to thank uh, Daria Bagina, founder, trainer, and coach at Scrum Mastered for joining the show. You can learn more about Daria and Scrum Mastered by following the links in the show notes. Talk with you next week. Thanks again for listening to the Agile Brand with Greg Kilstrom podcast, brought to you by Tech Systems. If you enjoyed the show, please take a minute to subscribe on your podcast channel of choice and leave us a rating so that others can find the show more easily. You can access more episodes of the show at www.gregkilstrom.com. That's G-R-E-G-K-I-H-L-S-T-R-O-M.com. To get a copy of my latest book, House of the Customer, visit my website or you can find it on Amazon or other retailers. The Agile brand is produced by Missing Link, 
a Latina-owned, strategy-driven, creatively-fueled production co-op. From ideation to creation, they craft human connections through intelligent, engaging, and informative content. Until next time, stay agile.